morning and welcome. This is Tampa Home Talk and uh, like many of you probably been off for a couple of days. We're back in swing today at least. You have myself, I'm almost, some of us are. You were there yesterday, Pat. Oh yeah, and I've got to tell you real quick, I left my house in the Citrus Park area and I did not see, pass, or go near another vehicle until the top of the hump of the Howard Franklin Bridge headed into Pinellas. It was two Ford pickup trucks like mine that were headed in there. Otherwise, east, west, anywhere I looked yesterday morning, there wasn't a car on the road. So I was looking at the, the map or the, uh, the live traffic cams over the bridge, and there was nobody on the bridge yesterday. So I pretty much stayed home till the afternoon. I'll tell you how my day wrapped up yesterday in a minute. But for those of you just tuning in, I'm your host, Katrina Madewell with Keller Williams Realty, and this is Tampa Home Talk. And joined by my, oh, my we, sidekick, my, we, my science nerd. Leo Kane with Barrel Engineering and Inspection. Those, those are the two most important words right now, engineering and inspection. Yes, and Mr. Adam Talley, of it, course, is not here. I mean, as, reason. as the insurance company industry collapses into only citizens in the next four or five oh, months. Gosh, that's scary. Well, what I hate about losing insurance companies, now you have to remember there were 12 companies that they were trying to derate before this hit because they were financially unstable. That's painful. So what happens with your insurance agent is as everyone gets pushed to citizens, they end up having to do double and triple work for no commission. So go easy on your insurance agents out there. Wait, so they don't get paid when they sell a policy to citizens? No, it's not really selling a policy. And you have to think if the carrier goes out of business and they're the carrier's citizens. switching over to citizens. So they're not making any money. They're just switching policies. Got it. Yeah, yeah, so go easy on your insurance agents. They're going to be doing a lot of work, double and triple work for you if you're their client. So I have to say, I just, I want to comment on a few things and I'm not uh, by any means minimizing the disaster of this hurricane because it definitely is, is a big one. There's a lot of damage. I will tell you though, when you look at like the national news, it's, they, they make it look worse than it is, right? Like according to the national news, the entire state of Florida has been flattened by Hurricane Ian, right? Like, well, it's, I mean, <sighs> I'm just telling you, that's, that's pretty much like what I see. I've got so many calls in the last couple of days from friends in other states, you know, like California and just all around the U.S. are like, are you okay? I'm so worried about you. Are you going to evacuate? I'm like, no, no, no. I think we're fine where we are. And it's likely, it looks like it's moving south of us. Well, as people were checking on me, I was also checking in with, you know, some of my friends and people that I know. And as, you know, the nature, as the luck of irony, I guess, would have it, one of my friends, I live right here in Pinellas County, they evacuated, right? They were in an A zone. It was a mandatory hurricane evacuation order. So they got out. So they went south oh to boy. Bonita Springs. That's not good. And they were staying at an Airbnb with, uh, you know, one of our, our friends down there owns it. And basically she said, hey, the uh, the sheriff is making everybody leave, you know, because this is mandatory evacuation. So they may come by and knock on the door, but, you know, just don't answer the door and then they'll leave. So literally she said it, this was, well, this was yesterday. The story was right. So it was the day before, but she says, we literally were taking a nap. It was her, her husband and her son. And she says, or actually her son says, I heard this thing like clinking, like this bolt that came off of something. It was like clinking. And then the next thing you know, I hear somebody banging on the door, you know, and calling his mom by name. She's like, that's not the sheriff, you know? So literally they had sent someone in a, a large, taller pickup truck to come get them because the water was rising so quickly that they barely got out and I don't know if you saw this but I posted a picture I don't use social media I know you don't but Pat may have seen it so I posted a picture of what this thing looked like when they left and the bottom line is it was already pretty much over the roof where where the house was that they were staying and so she he said that he you know it happened so quick of course that storm surge is probably the bigger threat out of anything oh yeah no definitely because with and i said i wasn't going to do that this hour we everyone in this in our listening area has been scienced to death about hurricanes so i'm not going to explain the science of a hurricane during this hour 
Yeah. So I'm showing Leo a picture. So they weren't in this one, but they were in this one. So when you look at this, it's literally... Well, our viewers can't uh, see the picture. So but basically, it. it's uh, water that is basically... You've got pickup trucks, the tall raised pickup trucks, and the water is above the wheel wells. Yeah, well, there's a car next to it, and the water is all the way to the hood. And this is when they were out, and the water level continued yeah. to rise from this point. Yeah, and, I'm, I'm in, and I promise you, listeners, this hour, I am not going to science you at all about hurricanes because i a bit because no there's really no science it's the tokabaga indians that are <laughs> it, no it, that's it is, the folklore of the it area is the folklore of the, but um yeah they we'll just, take it walker folklore we will take they've it they've been scienced and, and i remember saying back in may if we have a really dry rainy season we're going to have a really really vicious hurricane this fall right around october you so it's two days i remember early. you saying it, it two yes. days early but we had it so yeah, like, like the calm before the storm, literally, right? Yeah. So anyway, I'm checking in with them, and I, I at first I thought maybe she was joking, but I, I texted and said, hey, how are you guys doing? She's like, well, uh, we evacuated down south on the Airbnb we were staying at got flooded, and uh, both of our cars are completely underwater, lost. Flood, that's their transportation to get there, flooded, lost. Called the insurance company, which you can barely get out to try to make a claim. And they're like, hey, can we get a rental car or something? They're like, yeah, no, there's no rental cars anywhere near you, like at all. They're all out of the state, you know, or somewhere else. So I was like, okay. I was like, well, is the water gone where you guys are at? And she said, yeah, it seems to be gone where we're at. Of course, they don't know how far, like from the interstate that is. So I said, all right, I will get in the car and I'll try to come get you, right? I have to tell you, if I didn't drive an electric car on an amazing, like, real-time network, I probably would not have done it because every place is out of gas. Mm -hmm. The airports are closed. I mean, there's no – you don't even know where to stop to get gas because there's no way to tell that. Yeah, and the airports are actually – I think Tampa International opened today. 10 o'clock this morning they opened. Mm -hmm. So literally I went down there and you can see on the Tesla, it shows you all the supercharging networks and literally the, the furthest one south on the west coast of Florida that was open was Venice. And it was like, it literally said long wait time on it. So the next one above that was Sarasota. So South Sarasota. So I drive as far as I can and I stop at that supercharger. I charge all the way to 100%. So my car will tell me like if I put in that address and then I put in the address back to the supercharger, how long that's going to take. You know, and do I have enough juice to get there and back? So I put it in and it li at first it says negative 10% like when I was charged. Oh boy. So I was like, yeah, no, I got to wait and see how this pans out. So I had to wait to go all the way to 100%. So if any of you have Teslas, you know, the fuller the battery gets, the slower the charge. It's when you look at like the number of kilowatts per hour on these fast superchargers, they'll get real high, like over 900, almost 1,000. It, so go, it goes really, really How quick. long does it take to, uh, so, for an average day, how long would a supercharger take to charge a car? Oh, so Not to 100%, just for normal five ten minutes oh that's, that's and that was awesome. the case on the way back because there were superchargers north of sarasota yeah. that were all working literally i stopped um twice so i stopped there to basically for like 10 minutes to get enough juice and then it took me all the way to the saint pete supercharger five minutes there and i had enough to drop them off and get home that's pretty cool but you have to think with let me ask you a question if you had the opportunity and i think it's going to come up now People in the Bay Area here, do you think a lot of homes along the beach are going to come up for sale? Yeah, I mean, I think we see normal ebbs and flows of that. And then when you combine that with things like the condo market, right, that are over three stories, especially these older units, we're going to see a lot of those start to hit the market. And you got to think rates are now north of 7% already. Well, yeah, I also have to think, are they going to, and I, I was thinking we were spending a lot of time talking about the future of the real estate market in Florida during this hour, because that's the value we can bring that people we aren't will, talking yeah. about. So I, I think long term, we're always, we always have these ebbs and flows, right? I mean, I've sold properties for people that literally, we just had a hurricane that scared them, they left and moved somewhere else, right? But I think for the most part, most people that live here understand, we live in paradise 99% of the time right? So there, every place you live is going to have one thing that will impact the area. And our one thing happens to be hurricanes. And our one thing happens to be getting worse and worse every year. But would I take that over like or tor tornado or a wildfire in California or some of this other crazy stuff? 
yeah, I would. Yeah. I've got days to prepare and go somewhere else. I mean, Pat will tell you, we were on a cruise during Irma, right? Mm -hmm. It was like the best cruise we ever went on. We'll tell you more about... Well, we'll tell you more about that when we come back. Our off-air number, if you want to get some information, is 813-377-2775. If you're thinking about selling, you want more information, we're going to give you a whole bunch of updates this hour on what's open, what's not, and what's happening. 813-377-2775. And we'll give you our real estate numbers as soon as we come back. This is Tampa Home Talk. Stick around. We'll be right back. Welcome home. This is Tampa Home Talk. We are your hosts today. We got Katrina Madewell from Keller Williams, and we got Leo Kane from Barrel Engineering and Inspection. And I imagine Adam will be back next week. Oh, yeah. Adam should be back. He's going to be very busy. He's got a lot of people to help with claims, the different nuances of the claims. I mean, that that's probably going to be the, the biggest area of the storm is a whole bunch of people who didn't have flood insurance got flooded. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a second. Real quick, just to report the numbers out. We won't spend a lot of time on it because we know this data is going to be a little skewed being that, you know, everything was shut down for a couple days. So new listings coming in at 434. Mm-hmm. Price decreases 509 for the week. Number of solds 470. And the number of pending data, 577. That's probably people who are all doing out-of-state transactions with out-of-state brokers. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, we had one that literally closed like the day, like it was, what day was it? Tuesday. Closed Tuesday. And, and, uh, you know, the, uh, the builders never give us like enough notice i don't think to like plan accordingly it it irritates me but that's another conversation for a different day so pat your question was on point you know and i think it's a good one for leo to answer if if you want to ping it out there did he take off he's in another studio yeah ask it again i think it's very relevant well which i asked couple in the break i asked one which one are you talking about in terms of like running people off in florida and like new building standards and code changing you just said you talked to someone like that at the uh the phillip station for your tesla did he want to move or did no <laughs> no so the guy had just moved from new jersey last year he lived in the southern part of sarasota and he said, oh, I just moved from New Jersey a year ago. And then he's talking about like the exit tax where they want to charge you 1% you know, on the sale of your property when you leave the state. Mm-hmm. And he's like, I have another property. I just went there and then I left the state and I didn't tell him. So he's like, I'm not paying it. I'm not. And I don't blame him on a million bucks. Would you want to pay a 1% exit tax? I mean, no. you, come on. If you're a politician, wake up. Like that is not smart. You know, it's not good leadership at all. But aside from that... It's, he wasn't scared. He moved here from New Jersey a year ago and he said, he kind of made a joke of it. He goes, well, I thought I might get broken a little bit with a cat one or two hurricane, not a cat five. You know, there was a video on TikTok where a guy said he just, I think we're talking about the same guy. He was just screaming that he had to pay a million dollars to leave um, New Jersey and he moves here and now his house is destroyed by a hurricane. (sighs) And he was just... What did your guy look like? This guy was a big guy with curly hair. No, he was an Asian guy. Oh. Looked Asian. <laughs> uh. going around. Yeah, well, I mean, we've had a lot of people move here from yeah, other we've, states. We've been talking about it, that, that during the height of the pandemic, uh, when our governor reopened everything six mo- six weeks after the whole nation shut down, I mean, that, that drew a lot of people here, especially with the, the work remote. Then companies re-headquartered here. So even though they're doing split work remote, come into the office, split 60s, 40s, 40s, 60s, those people still are able to live here. This is a very um, interesting to live in state. What I'm going to be curious with is Florida Building Code updates every three years. We're due... When was the last update? Almost three years ago? It was uh, the 2020 Building Code. Oh, So we're due for a 2023 Building Code. will actually go into effect next June. I mean, it will will be passed next June and go into effect next December. I was going to say, so question for you, if I have a home and I'm getting a permit, say now in 2022. Oh, it's going to be built to the 2020 standards. Florida Building Code. But I'm going to be very interesting between Surfside or we're calling Senate Bill 4D and between this, what are they going to do in the next eight months for the Florida 2023 Building Code? 
Because you know those wind maps are going to change. So here's the thing, and you can comment on this from a from a construction engineering slash inspection perspective, you know. But as a layperson that knows a little bit about a lot of that stuff, I would say they're just going to require everything to be raised construction. So well, that's first different. floor garage. That, that's, that, those are flood maps, and that's all going to be based on the flood maps, which I also think are going to change. They just redid the flood maps two years ago. Look at the central part of Florida. I think they're going to re be redoing flood maps. I mean, you had that the 100 year storm hit with the 100 year heights, and you don't build to the 100 year. So there's different there's different buildings. There's the five year storm, the 25 year storm, the 50 year storm, the 100 year storm. You build uh, to basically the 50 or 25 year storm because to build to the 100 year storm is just wasted money because they're you're not going to see the 100 year storm in four or five lifetimes. Well, it makes sense. So that's what they do. But I'll be really interested to see how they, in the next eight months, change the Florida building code for 2023 to take into account what just happened. So what do you think they're going to change construction-wise? So obviously, solid block all the way up. That's a possibility. Solid block all the way up. Um, a lot of There was a lot of talk on the weather outlets about these clips on your roof uh, during, during this pre-storm. They're like, yeah, the roofs will stay on because they've got these little metal clips. That's fine. I've seen a lot of pictures from other storms with whole roofs are blown off. I was like, is that going to hold your, a your, Cat 5? Your roof will when? come off in one piece. Yeah, I saw. We saw that. Yeah, right? that, that, that's videos. what happens. I mean, your, your your trust system and your roof will come off in one piece. So, so. Is it, so there's no way really to anchor that unless, of course, you were to take those the anchors or the straps and basically put those into concrete. Pretty much. And I mean, the, the best construction, if you really are going to build to Cat 4 or Cat 3, you were looking at concrete buildings from the ground up, and you were looking at a concrete roof, and you were going to paint that roof white to have the solar reflectivity to help with global warming. Because uh, uh, which honest, might help with pretty much might but, uh, help with less hurricanes. <laughs> uh, honestly, I mean, I, I this 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 I know I've been joking about the white power movement on this show now for several years, but it's real. If okay, we, all we do not mean that in any type of crazy way. So. We paint all the roofs white that are concrete or using white shingles, you will increase solar reflectivity, you will cool down the earth. I mean, they're already experimenting with the white power movement in California where they're painting streets. Yeah, I remember white. I sent you that, that TikTok. Did you open it? It was I a TikTok. Did. It was good. I mean, that's what we need. We need more white surfaces. Yeah, it's so the interesting thing, and if you're new to the area, it's important to understand that homeowners insurance doesn't cover if you have a flood. It doesn't cover any rising water, only falling water. So from a damage perspective, right, I'm thinking, okay, yes, you have to rip out everything, what, maybe three, four feet lower, right? So Yeah, pretty much basically if you if you flood, you're looking at like the bottom three feet of your drywall coming out. Rip it out. You have to dry out all the two by fours. Dry all dry out the framing, dry everything out. However, when it comes to your insurance claim, you're gonna get partial denials. They're only gonna pay for top down water. They're not gonna pay from down down up water. And companies like myself are pretty much going to have to now specialize in being able to forensically, which we already do this, tell the difference between rising water and falling water. So are you telling me that the storm surge is, that they had in Fort Myers Beach, none of that's going to cover, insurance is not going to cover any of those homes? If, not if they have, don't have flood insurance, no. If they don't have flood insurance, um, that, that, that's the question. I've already started asking the public adjusters that question. If, you, if your home is catastrophically destroyed from both the top down and the down up uh how's we it going to get total loss is a total loss total loss is still total loss however if they're going to say it's total loss due to rising water they're going to try and get out and I, I don't actually blame them there's not enough money in the state of florida to cover all this from insurance so the insurance companies are still going to do what insurance companies do they're going to look for reasons to deny your claim and if you have a joint flood and wind claim they're, they might they might only do partial coverages. We don't know how they're going to react. The only thing I can't... Talk, Go ahead, Pat. I talked to three people. They said, I do not have home insurance. And, and Adam says this all the time, that there's a period that you can call and get insurance. And a lot of these people, two out of the three did not know. The third one did know, but couldn't do anything. Mm. So they were riding it out on Treasure Island with no insurance. There's How many people do you think... No way I would do that. Oh, there's a lot of there's people. There's a lot, but there's I wouldn't a, do that. Yeah, there's a lot of people who don't have insurance. I know a, a property owner. He owns like a bunch of condos around town. 
he doesn't actually have insurance on the condos. He has a liability insurance because that's what he's required to have, but the condos are unprotected. I mean, if you, at some point you have to weigh the risk, does it make sense to self-insure and save that money, which most people I would say probably are not. Mm-hmm. It, this, I mean, in some instances, when you look at like the housing issues of 08, right? Yes, we had all those bad mortgages that kind of created that. But part of the, the challenge was, you know, people got so, they were so, basically the economy was in such a state like it is now, right? Where it, back then a lot of people had lost their jobs and that sort of stuff. The people were doing what they call like the sinkhole lottery, right? Where they just have the insurance company check to see if they had a sinkhole and see if you can get your house paid off so that you can stay at it because you didn't actually qualify for it to begin with, right? right. So that's a little, it's a little different, right? Because they had to pay the whole thing off. But what we're seeing now is people that should have replaced their roof because it was aged, you know, and, and they, they it, sh- it was time for it to be replaced, trying to claim it under storm damage. And that's what put a lot of these carriers out of business and made them insolvent because it's cheaper to write a check than it is to fight it, right, with, it, with an attorney. So, unfortunately, all those claims, that's why we saw so many carriers go upside down. And now you compile something like this on top of that. And, it, it, and people wonder why insurance is so expensive. I mean, we're, we're about three times higher than any other place. Oh, I see, I see citizens enacting their 40% raise thing. And if Adam was here, he'd probably say the same thing. So we're looking at whatever your insurance rate is right now, come January, it's probably going up 40%. Which is crazy. That may force, I mean, that could have a huge impact on our prices here. This is Tampa Home Talk. We'll give out our number as soon as we come back. Welcome home. This is Leo Kane with Barrel Engineering and Inspection, joined with Katrina while we talk the future of the housing market. Yeah, it's you know it's a relevant point, and there's a there's a couple things in this outline that I printed are worth mentioning, and it will tie right into to what you're saying with regards to what does the housing market look like in the future of Florida after we have you know, storms like Ian come through. So first and foremost, if you were affected, be careful and don't try to avoid some of these door knockers, right? That give you, oh, we'll take care of everything. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Well, I mean, speaking to that regards, Florida has done passed several laws to help protect you. I mean, they, they've got done away with AOB, which is assignment of benefits where a contractor can knock on your door. Oh, it is gone. I thought it was gone. I don't know for sure. I thought I thought like roofers can't be or contractors can't get your AOB. I it hope needs so. to be like an adjuster. I'm gonna go. Not that a may lo- have been in that recent change because there was a lot of laws that passed. There, there were laws yeah. that passed to protect you. What, what I'm scared for our listening audience is you're gonna have these every contractor who can swing a hammer in the entire country is probably on their way here, and he all the money hungry ones, and a lot of them are gonna scam scam our listeners, and that's what I'm worried about. I'm worried about you get a knock on the door. You sign over your benefits, you give them a deposit, yeah. and you never see from them again. It, it's important. You don't need to do that. You know, insurance companies are going to work with you. If you feel like your insurance company is jacking with you and you've done all that you can and they're either denying or underpaying your, your claim, give us a call. We'll get you connected with Aaron, with uh, Dan, he and Dunavit. They fight insurance companies for a living to make sure they don't underpay or deny your claim when they should be paying it. So mm-hmm. you might want to take down our off-air number and make them in useful for you in the future. 813-377-2775. Just call or text that number, which is uh, 813-377-2775. Again, 813-377-2775. Also, to just let the listeners know right now, to do any contracting in Florida, you need to have a state of Florida license. So all these guys coming in from Texas, and Oklahoma. And insurance, ask for it. Yeah, you, you need to have a state of Florida license. So check the licenses on anyone you're going to do business with because you cannot do business with an out-of-state company. And what they do is they say, you can just file a homeowner permit and we'll do the work for you. I think people are going to get desperate. That's the loophole. Yeah, of course they're going to get desperate. This is another thing that's very scary. 
Um, forget the contractors and the roofers right now in the Bay Area because we're going to have some, yes, but not as much as the people are going to go up and down the streets and say, we're going to trim your trees or clean up this mess, or there's a tree down that they're going to take care of that. And they have no license at all, and if they get hurt on your property, what happens then? Right. Oh, uh, true. Speaking of which, the federal disaster assistance was approved, so you can get things like temporary assistance and accommodations for living and expenses, but it also covers debris removal at 100% for up to 30 days. Um, it's 100% reimbursement rate, and uh, they've declared it for basically Charlotte, Collier, DeSoto, Hardy, Hillsborough, Lee, Manatee, Pinellas, and Sarasota. Now, counties. the debris removal aspect of it, if it's the debris monitoring like I'm thinking that I did for 20 years, you have to bring it to the curb. Likely. Yeah. Yes, I would imagine. And that they do order pickups, you know. There's still 2.6 million people without power right now and a lot of cell phone towers down over 12 counties. So going back to what you were saying before, and this this will be interesting. So to tag right on to the, the future of the housing market, what does it look like? How does insurance play a part? Well, Citizens Property Insurance, their CFO quoted inside uh, property and casualty saying that the estimated loss for state-backed insurer, which is, again, the carrier of last resort, will be anywhere from $1.9 billion to $3.7, with a B, billion. And, and they're estimated to have at least 225,000 claims. And uh, it's saying basically $3.8 billion they quoted uh, before the storm took, you know, that east turn and just went straight up the middle part of the state. Well, it actually didn't didn't do the Charlie trend exactly. It didn't go up the middle. It actually went out towards Over, Melbourne. Yeah. Yeah, the other storm, that would have gone Daytona. But, yeah, I mean, you have to think your insurance rates, they're going to put that forced 40% extra on your policy come January. I see that coming. Yeah, so let's talk about that because this ties right into it. So they, they basically, the Florida Office of Insurance Regulation said that they're, they're going to temporarily suspend for two months. Your insurance company can't cancel you or non-renew you. But it's only really protection for 90 days. So when you look at that, it's almost October. That's January. Mm-hmm. Which is exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, th that's where the money is going to come. And then we got the rising interest rates. So, so again, Katrina, what happens to a housing market when um, you have houses that are being foreclosed on that need a lot of repair work? You have homeowners who can't afford to improve their homes. Um, they're just going to need to sell to downgrade. What happens to a housing market when that much inventory hits in that type of inventory? So hits? I think you'll have a, a couple of different things, right? You'll have people maybe that really can't afford it, but they're going to piece it together in small stages and take a very long time to make the repair, right? Because they either don't have insurance or their company is not going to pay for it. And, or it was rising flood water, right? And they didn't have flood insurance. So I think you'll see that. And then you'll see another segment of the population that is just scared. They're like, see ya, I'm out of here. This cat vibe was too much for me. And then, you know, I, I think that the, the bigger issue is the cost of insurance rising. Combine that with the more affordable things are usually condos and townhomes. And if they're over three stories, you've got this other whole thing where they're going to be tacking on special assessments and rising HOA fees to cover rising insurance costs and updated construction costs. So I think the bigger long-term picture, and yes, it's going to cost more, but it's to build to a higher standard of construction. Well, building to a higher standard of construction only, only re impacts what's being replaced and what's coming in new it doesn't Correct. doesn't handle anything like i'd say well you can't fix everything you know what i mean that's there but you got to start somewhere yeah we're just the fema 50 rule is uh what she's talking about where if the cost of construction is more than 50 percent of the cost of your building <laughs> then they consider that a substantial improvement and you now need to build to the cur current codes for your whole house and that that's the fema 50 rule that that's how they force you to upgrade to the new codes right so, you know, a lot of people don't, and that's for even like cosmetic stuff. So you have to be careful with what you're updating, but it, it, it's a real thing. And so, you know, I think, and we talked about this before with Adam, people are going to start navigating to the newer construction because of the way they're built and that sort of stuff. And like you said, even with the hurricane straps and clips, it could just rip off the whole roof if the storm is strong enough. But again, if you had 
you know, these straps and they were in concrete and you did block and then poured block on the inside, that's a pretty strong, well-built house. No, it's still not as strong as just the whole roof being concrete and painted white. However, I... I do, I do agree that if the if your house... I think the problem with what you're saying and why a lot of people don't do it, other than cost, right? It's going to cost more. Well, yeah, cost more for concrete all the way up it, rather than wood frame. Appeal, design and appeal. Like, how do you get around the design and appeal, right? Just looking so funky. They look like boring boxes. I mean... Yeah, that's the challenge. The, the, the challenge is for architects versus engineers. Engineers are going to design something that's going to last, and architects are going to design something that looks pretty that leaks. <laughs> I mean, seriously. <laughs> You got to build like a square box. And yeah. Put a fake facade on the front. That just that the projectile facade. Yeah, I mean that. Yeah. that I guess that could rip up, but then if you're not getting yeah. flooded, that's good. I mean, yeah. So I mean, there's always going to be that that debate between the architects who want to build those dorm decorative dormers and those those nice little transitions and those weird sh shaped roofs. I mean, the strongest roof in Florida is going to be a flat roof. Your second strongest is going to be something called a hip roof, which is going to look like a mini pyramid. Uh, lower, lower the slope, the better. And if you think about it, you got all that. If you have the really steep, steep sloped roof with all that extra attic space, it's just wasted space. You're not living up there. You know what I thought was interesting talking about the whole rising water thing. Uh, one, uh, somebody was telling me that in you know New Orleans when Katrina hit because they're so low, they actually have roof hatches. Mm -hmm. that people climb up in the attic and they go all the way out the roof if the water level gets high. To me, that's insane. It would never stay there. Well, Something I mean, like that. That, that. That's flat roof design. That's actually smart. I mean, I, back when I did work for Ike, um, there was a lot of deaths because as the rising water started, people fled into their attics. Well, and then you're trapped. Yeah, so that's what you, scary. What are your choices? You got, you've got... You drown to death or die in the attic. You dry, die, die, drown in the attic or you try and make a quote-unquote run for it. And then you're just at the mercy of the tides. There's no good solution there. That's why evacuation about, orders need to be followed. What about building the homes close to the water? Round. What Round? What do you mean? Round would help with the wind whipping around. Okay. The, the wind would just go around the building as opposed to... And I mean, they've experimented with that. If you look at, uh, I think, at the Sykes building. So if it, we do 3D printing, I mean, that's total... Yeah, concrete. I mean, if you can... 3D print, I mean, back when I was doing the stuff in South America with the 3D printing of houses using a concrete printer, those weren't, those Wait, were just Wait, you did that in story. South America? South America. You did? Uh, How was, long ago was that? I was on the design team. I didn't oh. actually go down there to watch darn, the construction. Darn, that's pretty fascinating. But it was. I mean, they, they set up a printer and it prints your shell and then you go through and put the utilities in. It's actually a pretty neat process. You're not getting anything other than a boring box, but... Your boring it's, box is going to be nice. but It's then, hard to imagine what a 3D printing looks like, right? For me, I couldn't get a visual on that. So I'll, well, so I'll give you a description of this so it makes sense what a 3D printed house looks like. So if you've ever seen a cake decorator do the icing oh, on yeah, the when you're outside of a the cake, house. Yeah. that's kind of what it is. It's like icing on top of icing on top of icing on top of icing. Yeah, but only the, the cake way. isn't spinning. The, the machine is spinning around. Right, the machine is spinning yeah. back and forth. But it's hard to imagine what a 3D printed house no it's like. basically what it does. yeah it's just basically it, it's got this liquid concrete it's spitting it out like ink and it's huge and it's just like a a printer of 3dness it, it's moving instead of doing like because we, we think of printers was going back and forth on a sheet of paper and the paper's moving up yeah uh well here the whole machine is spinning around and the house is still obviously in the, in the house is still so it's neat you get a shell it's fast construction it's sturdy construction it's awesome construction it can withstand a lot of storms, but it, bore, it looks boring, the box. Yeah, some of them will get, have some little rounded designs, like what Pat was saying. Yeah, I mean, the better the technology gets, the, the better the design. So from an engineering perspective, just a question on the flat, strong concrete roof. How is that? What's the construction behind that, right? Because it's heavy. Concrete's heavy and there's gravity. So what's the construction behind that? Well, you can still have pylons. So instead of looking, you might be called slab on grade, but you're going to be doing pylons, which are basically piers underneath the ground. Uh, the reason why Surfside Tower collapsed, one of many, was the pylons um, that they, they built were half the size they should have been. Ooh. So that, that's, that's an example of those pylons are what's going to keep your house up. So your house isn't actually slab on grade. It's just pier and beam on grade, I guess you would call it. <laughs> Most people are like, what is he talking about right now? 813-377-2775. If you need an inspection due to the storm for insurance purposes or other, 
75. We are fully staffed. Most of our staff has electricity, and we are out and about in the Bay Area making sure that you and yours are safe indoors. And you're going to need them if you're new to the area and you're under contract to buy or sell right now and the buyer has a lender, they're going to require a reinspection. So they're going to require somebody like Leo or one of the appraisers like Danielle to go back out and do a reinspection. So they'll be busy for a few weeks to come. This is Tampa Home Talk. Are you looking Welcome home, Tampa Home Talk, 813-377-2775, 813-377-2775, for all your real estate, insurance, inspection, and engineering needs. So I just want to give a shout out to a lot of our, our first responders, and my husband happens to be one of those first responders. He was literally at work for 72 hours straight and had to get up and do it again this morning. So, you know, there's a lot of these guys and the, and the power people, oh my gosh, driving down south. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of power trucks. Never seen so many ever in one place. Well, they turned those, that COVID staging area where they, you got the waters, that uh, gambling park, I forget what it's called, the waters in 275. Oh, yes, the dog track. The dog track, yeah, that's a staging ground. I, I passed that this morning and it's just filled with power trucks. Yeah, there's a there's a bunch all over. I saw National Guard deployed. I even saw Pasco County sheriffs going south to help. People pulling generators, yeah, just anything, loads of stuff. Yeah, anyone. So if you are a first responder, thank you. You're thank you, and you're being sent into the fray. If you're not a first responder, do not go there. Do not head south right now. Yeah, I, I would not recommend it. I did it in a, to try to pick up some friends to try to get them in and out. I wasn't sure if I was even going to be able to get to them after driving down there. Definitely didn't see anything because it was so dark. But I did see a ton of trees like on the side of the interstate down and signs. A lot of signs ripped and gone or just mangled. Yeah, if you're not, time. P- not part of an EOC movement, which is an emergency operating center, if you're not part of a movement, if you're not a first responder, if you head south... And you run out of gas, you've now just become part of the problem yeah, instead of the solution. Yeah, that's a that's a big, like I said, if I had a gas car that I was driving, I probably would have had to say no. Yeah, you wouldn't have made it there and back. <laughs> yeah, I would be too afraid about that. So anyway, uh, Tampa International Airport opened this morning at 10. So they're opening in 10 minutes. Yep, 10 minutes. As soon as we're off the air, uh, St. Or Sarasota Bradenton is emergency operations only. Makes Southwest sense. Florida International Airport closed. Uh, Punta Gorda Airport, the runway is is being cleared right now, so they're trying to get you guys to reopen. Orlando and also Orlando International and Sanford are both emergency operations only. Daytona is closed. Gainesville suspended operations at 6 a.m. Jacksonville closed. Melbourne closed. Uh, Northeast Florida Regional Airport, emergency operations only, and then North Perry Airport closed. So the rest of them should still be open yeah, or the, have the, reopened. And the ones that are closed today on the East Coast or Orlando, those should be opening tomorrow, hopefully. Uh, maybe Sunday. Orlando, at least. Yeah, may, well, it says emergency operations only, so yeah. it may be a minute. And, and the, the reason why is like you have so many people to do a movement like this on a restoration. They're actually flying in support from all over the country. Yes. Be it line crews from Alaska or California or Seattle. I think I saw like 26 different states deployed line people here. Oh, yeah, to they, help they do. Yeah. It was a lot. That, that's always neat um, when that happens. Uh, I was part of that's how I started my hurricane restoration work uh, from 98 to 2004 was with the power company. It's always neat watching that deployment movement. They'll move people here that can't drive here in a reasonable amount of time, and then everyone else is just driving here. Where do you actually start as those linemen go out? I was wondering. I mean, they pull up somewhere, and the poles are down, and the wires are across the road, but you can't do anything there until you do it before or after that. Well, the f- they start? They start with sending um, basically the engineers out or the desk people out. They send them out to ride the power grid lines and just chart what's up, what's not, just to know what poles are there. How do they tell what's what's live and what isn't? Like, the, nothing's live. They're just okay, driving so around sense. seeing, hey, uh, well, I mean, physical you can, poles up, physical poles up, transformers that are, haven't exploded. Um, most of your transformers have a little thing that looks like a U hanging off the side of it. That's the fuse. So the, the next step, typically after they've driven all the lines, is they'll send those same people out again with big sticks that go up 30 feet, extended sticks, and they're going to try and fuse the transformers back in. Again, they're going to see what blows. So what ends up happening is you might have power today, 
and you might lose power tomorrow because when they're re-energizing the line, something they don't know about blows. Mm. And, that, and that's why you end up with, like for me, I had internet during the whole storm and then I lost internet the next afternoon. I know exactly why. They're re-energizing different sections and that section they re-energized was connected to something that was bad. It makes sense. It's, it's a good question, Pat. You know, to give a shout out to some of the, the businesses that are taking care of our first responders. So Culver's, Firehouse Subs, Burger King, uh, Four River Smokehouse, Anna Maria Oyster Bar, Texas Roadhouse. And uh, Bucky's is also giving away meals and soft drinks to first responders on their way uh, to the area in, in Daytona, basically up to October 2nd. That's pretty neat because you have to think yeah. with your first responder flying in, Tampa is going to be the busiest airport for that because you basically fly into the closest airport that you can hit and they tell you a Walmart. It's going to be Tampa. They, you hit a Walmart or a Target, you stock up. Load up. And you stock up, you get your rental car, and then you head right to your EOC. A lot of the rental cars aren't here, though, still. I think they're bringing them back as of today. They're, gonna, they're bringing cars in. They yeah, have they're going to gonna have to. But that's what you do. You get to your closest airport that's open, which is Tampa. Um, so if you live near the Tampa International Airport, um, that Walmart, that Super Target, those are going to be drained of supplies because those first responders, that's the first place. They're, they're going there to stock up. Um, and then they're going to head to where they need to unless they're part of a team. And then their manager is going there to stock up. Yeah, it makes sense. It's it's definitely it's hard hit. We, we got spared here in Tampa for sure. So let's pray for those that are south. It's a, you know very devastating to see some of this stuff that's happened to them. And, and, you know, some people it's going back to what you said, Leo, with regards to, is it going to scare some people off? It may, but I think anywhere you live, you're going to have stuff. The best thing you can do is to save cash and live below your means. And I know that's getting harder and harder with inflation just so high, but you have to, you have to find a way to start out right. You know what I mean? Yeah, if I mean, you prices, don't start in the hole. Prices are going to go up on supplies now because there's going to be such a need to do 30 to $40 billion worth of work. Um, and I don't know, were those numbers based on it hitting Tampa or based on where it hit? No, that was just based on uh, citizens. Projection. Mm -hmm. So yep. that's not where it actually hit. I mean, you have to think the number is, is going to be lower. They said 3.8 initially, yeah. I think, was what the estimation 3 was. 3.8. That number will be lower since that estimate was based on hitting Tampa. It's still horrendous and it's still large, but the number, the actual debt nav damage number will be lower because of the path it actually took. Yeah, it was a little lower. I think it said uh, 1.9 billion to 3.7, but mm -hmm. the projection was 3.8. It's still a large number, a very, very large number. You can't. Yep, my think. memory was right. 1.9 billion to 3.7, estimated 3.8 hey, billion. Guess what reopens today? Villardas. Villardas. Bingo. How do we know? It's Friday. All right, you guys. Thanks for listening. And uh, help all those that you can. If you can donate to the Red Cross or some of those places that are making a trip down south to help others in need, please do that. If you can open your home or offer to take someone in that maybe lost theirs, do all you can to help our fellow Floridians. So we're so glad you're here. Thanks for listening. Hope we brought you some value. If we can answer any questions for you or be a resource, please don't hesitate to call or text us at our off-air number, 813-377-2775. Love where you live or we're going to fix it. Welcome home. Love where you live.